But this question is the question. Take a photo of it. Because this is the one I want you to think about tonight. If you were to go for crazy in the next 10 years, what would crazy look like? What would like mind-boggling insane look like? What would ultimate success look like? Health and family and relationships and finance and impact and contribution. Now you've all heard this before. And remember, I'm only on point number one. And point number one is I've lost the fire. How do I get it back? And Deb, this is temporary, but if we don't relight the fire, what happens? We become complacent. All right, so we got a lot of ground to cover, and I know I got a bunch of drifters drifting in the room. So, uh, hey, can we really fast for all of us in the room? Look back to that camera over there, and let's give about 15,000 people around the world a big shout out watching on the live cast. Can you guys do that for me? Thank you. I know some of you are in big rooms, some of you are by yourself. We want to just say thank you so much. All right. I know people are drifting in. I don't care. We're going to get started. Let's, we got a lot of ground to cover. How many of you say I if this is your first summit? Say I. All right. Tom X was a warm up. And yet, inside of that warm up, you got a tremendous amount of value. Um, hard, hard to argue against for me, having started that in 2012. That was the best Tom X I'd ever seen. Um, each and every one of them. Could we give all of them just a giant round of applause as a thank you? I know many of you, many of you inside this room have been on this stage and you've done something similar. So Brian, it's just, it's fun to watch like a Maureen get up and talk about just one little thing that she does that generates 30 or 40 listings a year as the like number 13 or 14 broker in all of Manhattan, right? To get those insights. But before we go into this, I'm actually gonna go here. That's who's watching right now around the world. We got some pretty good coverage. Lots of different languages, lots of interesting people, lots of great real estate professionals everywhere. But in your workbook, go to, I think it's like page 29 or something. Find that wherever you are. And Adam, what I want to do is just take a second and get settled around, why are you here? And I'd love, as you get to page 29, I'd love you to write down very quickly, like, Matt, what are the three reasons that you're here? It could be, what is it you want out of the event? It could be, you're looking for something specific in your business. It could be, man, I just needed a break, right? So just write down very quickly, what are the three reasons that you're here? And then as soon as you got it, I want you to share it with the person to your right or left. What are the three reasons that you're here? What do you most need from our experience and time together? What do you need? Write it down. What do you most need? Why are you here? What's up, Charles Netter? What do you need? Why are you here? And again, I honor the fact that I have friends inside the room that this could be their 15th, 16th, 17th summit. I still owe you a shirt. <laughs> so for them, it might be a different experience than maybe one of you that is watching live or here inside the room, and this is the first time that you're here. And you just got this incredible exposure of all these Tom Xers, and I'm about to come at you in a, in a very, dare I say, honest yet aggressive way. Because my whole conversation with you to get this thing started, Byron, is similar to what we did yesterday on the golf course, right? Minus the bad golf. But it was the exploration of what we need to be doing now to position ourselves, not just for the balance of the year, but for the next three to five years. So very quickly, just maybe share in your notes just one reason. Tell the person to your right or left or around you what is the one or two reasons why you're here? What do you most need from this conference? Share it really quick. Go. What do you got, Kenny? Why are you here? I love that. I love it. What do you got? Love it. Love it. What do you got? Yeah, exactly. The network, the community, right? Love it, love it. Yes, mindset. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so come back to me. Come back to me. So, Amy, I'm going to make the assumption very quickly that everybody inside this room is at a pretty high level of commitment when it comes to their success. Is that a fair assumption, yes or no? Right? That there's nobody inside this room that's, you know, questioning themselves at a high level. They're just like, Eddie, I'm here. I'm committed. What do I have to do? Like, you and I have been doing this for a long time together. We know what that feeling is like. But the second one is, I think a lot of you are starting to recognize that if you want things to change, the person sitting in your seat has got to make some adjustments. Is that fair? Okay, do me a favor, though. I want you to show your buddy visually, like, this is how much change you need to make, or this is how much change you need to make. Show your partner how much change do you... Okay, I'm not looking for that much. I hope no one in this room is like, help me, change everything. Right? I think the vast majority of us, the vast majority of us, Joe, we're probably about this much. The, the challenge is, look up here, my friends, the challenge is, You've been making changes, Chris. You and I both know it, right? They've been making changes since August of last year. It's, we're down to the final mile, though. We're down to the changes that you've been resisting. We're down to the changes that you know you should do, but for whatever reason, sunk cost thinking, confirmation bias, you're just stuck. So I'm also going to make the argument that inside this room, you wouldn't be here online or together if you weren't wide open to new ideas. You weren't wide, I mean, it's like, it's, it's who we are as a community. It's who we are as an ecosystem, right? It's, Matt, it's pushing the envelope. It's being first into the marketplace. It's being the ones that are changing before everybody else. But then the last one is, I know you're here to maintain some level of focus and concentration to get the guardrails up because all of us have figured out, look up here, this is the market for the next three to five years. Are you excited? I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that this is the market because this is the time when the very best people get their heads on straight and take even more market share. And I'm going to make the argument, at least for the U.S. and Canada, that we only need 158,000 agents. That 158,000 agents is all we need. Now, hold on, hold on, because some of you that are clapping, you might ask yourself, what does it mean to be one of those? But I'm going to get to that in a minute. So why are we really here? For a lot of my friends, it's sharpening the ax. For some of you, it's getting updated and reconnected with friends, right? So many of us have these great relationships inside of this community. But I think the most important thing right now is this market is demanding concentration and focus like never before. Like, Glenda, the, you know, the world has shifted, and I think most of you are paying attention. It's really starting to shift, and the speed of technology is really catching up fast. I was at a conference just a week ago, and I'm sitting in Vegas, Inman was happening, I didn't go to that, I went to this thing called AI4, and David, I went there specifically to understand the legality side of AI, because you know we're in the midst of launching something for all of you, and I wanted to understand that, but more importantly, I wanted to sit down with a guy that created two products that all of you are very comfortable with. He was speaking at this conference for the first time, it was the first time he's really been out of his house in a while. Um, he created two products, I'm curious if you've heard of them. One is called Siri, and the other one's called Alexa. So he's my meeting Friday when this is over. Because I said to him, I work with the most extraordinary agents on the planet. We want to be first to market. We want to be the ones that are leading all this stuff. And this guy named Igor said to me, kind of a funky looking, but you would kind of expect someone that created Siri and, you know, Alexa to maybe be slightly strange. But he's my kind of strange, Eddie. We see all this stuff happening, but an environment with so much going on, we need to focus and concentrate on the right stuff. So I want to start by very quickly just thanking the people that helped me make this happen. Can we thank in advance all the speakers, the Tom X presenters? You can see everybody that's going to be here. Can we thank all of our clients that contributed all these extraordinary case studies? That, you know, many of you are going to be looking at all these and trying to reimagine your business. It's going to look a little bit like that. This group is very behind the scenes. This is my design team. This is my content creation team. These are the ones that put all this stuff together. So everything, when you look around here, they made it all happen. Could we give them a giant round of applause? Yes, 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 yes. And how about a big shout out to all of our coaches, the ones that are in the room and watching online. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, no. They deserve a lot of love. My design team, put my dog right there. 
I'm looking at it the other day and I was like, oh man, look at all these good looking coaches. And I was like, what is Duke doing on there? I just, I thought that was cute. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you guys for traveling to Dallas during this really great time of weather. Not just in Dallas, by the way, in the entire country, in case you're wondering. All right, so let's get to it. How's the market? How's the market? Hmm. In spite of the threats, my friends, failing banks, crypto collapse, commission compression, inventory, there's no solution in sight. By the way, look up here. There's no solution in sight. There is no solution in sight. The good news is builders are building pretty rapidly, and that helps them, and it helps some of us that get access to that stuff. But the reality is it looks like they're going to be about 30% of the U.S. market this year. And for my friends from Toronto, we still see 17 or 20 cranes in the sky. So we know it's progressing, but they can't build fast enough for the demand in the marketplace, yes or no, my friends. And then you take the class action lawsuit, which TikTok, TikTok is about two months away before we see, is it the end of buyer agency commissions as we know it, or is it the beginning of something new? Most of you know I'm betting on it's gonna be something new, which is why tomorrow morning, for the first time ever at a Tom Ferry Summit, I've asked Coach Alicia Essig to do her entire buyer agency presentation at 8.15 tomorrow morning. Do me a favor, turn to your buddy and say, drink less tonight. <laughs> Maybe drink nothing tonight because I asked her to start with me early and just for context, when you see why Matt is so important, you all know that it's gonna be the rich and the rest. Whatever happens in October, something is going to change and many of us will be positioned and ready, and many people will be stuck saying, what happened? And it's my obligation to all of you, my friends, to make sure that you are ready for it. So I wanna remind you, in this horrible market that you're all going through, in the US and Canada, there'll be $97 billion paid out in commissions this year. Okay, do me a favor, just turn to your buddy and say 97 billion. Maybe more importantly, tell your buddy how much of that you would like. All of it. I like that. I want global referral fees on all of it. We do not have a problem thinking big over here. And for my friends around the world, there will be hundreds of billions of dollars paid in commissions. And for context, who was selling houses in 2019? That's more than that was paid out in 2019. There'll be more commission income paid this year in the US and Canada, as an example, where I've got easy access to numbers, then we were paid out in 2019. And for many of you inside this room, prior to the anomaly of the pandemic, 2019 was one of your best years ever. So do me a favor, ready? Just, I want you to look lovingly into your neighbor's eyes. And if you have a threesome, this could be a moment. Yeah, baby. Look lovingly yeah. into their eyes and say, there's plenty of commissions for you. Oh, I love the hug right there. That was really good. See, yes, I like that. So let's talk about it. Read that out loud, please. Okay, we need like full church moment here. I need you to read that out loud with a big smile on your face. Go. That's the thing I'm obsessed with right now. Glenda, when we're out and we're doing the things that we do, how many people do we see that are just complacent right now? Complacent, let me give you another word. Complaining criticizing, comparing themselves to the past. All of that is a sign of complacency, unwilling to do the work that's required in this environment. I look at everyone else's complacency and I kind of get excited. We only need 158,000 agents between the US and Canada. It's hard for my friends in Europe. Maybe we just need 30 or 40,000 taking all of Europe together. Certainly down in like, uh, well, take, take Toronto. Do we really need 70,000 agents in Toronto for 7,000 sales a month? What do you guys think? I'd make the argument we have way too many agents and all of us can be a part of the solution for the consumer. So what's actually different about this market? Tell me if any of this resonates. The first one is the heart is clearly changed. So Matt, what was hard selling homes during the pandemic, remember putting on a full hazmat suit, spraying everything down, right? Like if you were in you know, Philadelphia, you couldn't even do anything until June or July. That was hard, right? But you were able to pivot, you were able to adjust but this is a different hard. This is a take your jacket off, roll up your sleeves, stop bitching, and do the work market.
this is a blue collar but make white collar revenue kind of environment. And if we can wrap our heads around that change, if you can wrap your head around your confirmation bias about what should be or how it's supposed to be done, if you can eliminate the sunk cost thinking and come into the reality of today's market, you can make a fortune in this market. $97 billion is gonna be paid out. The other thing is, guys, heads up, rates aren't gonna drop anytime soon. They're probably gonna go to nine, which is what I predicted last year. So when the rates go to nine, are you ready for that? Remember when no one was gonna buy a house in the sevens? Well, we're still gonna do in the US 4.2 million sales, so clearly somebody is still buying a house, even at a seven. There's no solution to inventory. There's a massive wave of new competitors. Do you know how many companies right now are being formed that look a little bit like LegalZoom meets we'll write your offer for $2? you know that that's gonna be hitting the market right away. They're like gearing up for October. Whatever's gonna happen, we're gonna see all these things launch. But here's the thing I keep writing down. No one's gonna save you. Do me a favor, in a very lovingly aggressive way, turn to your neighbor and say, no one is going to save you. For my friends in the US, there is no, no prospecting PPP money. Do you follow me? I would like some government funds because I won't make phone calls. That's not gonna happen. No one is gonna save you, which means it is 100% up to us to take responsibility for our rescue. Yes or no, my friends? Now, I know many of you are here like, I know, but you understand my situation. Anybody read these books? It's the Hunger Games right now. And the whole Hunger Game experience is some are going to live and some are going to die. Some are going to get all the listings and some aren't. Some are going to pivot and adjust. And remember, it wasn't always the strongest that survived. If you read these great books or watched any of the films, they were all fantastic. But it truly is becoming this environment where, Doug, it is so extreme, the haves and the have-nots. So here's my prediction for the next three to five years. You ready? This is the market for the next three to five years. Got it? This is the market. You should be like this. Yes! Because here's what's exciting. Every five additional transactions you add to your business, one agent has to leave. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Would it not be awesome if you could pick the agent? Can you imagine? You're like, hey, Phil had a good month. Pack it up, baby. You're done. I don't wish ill will on anyone but I truly believe in my heart of hearts, the customer does deserve a better experience, yes or no, right? How about Levi's story at the end about his agent that said, hey man, don't buy this thing, it's on wheels. Let me take you over here, right? That 30 seconds to tell the truth. We need more of that in our industry. So it's gonna be like this for the next three to five years. So for many, it's gonna be ugly. It's gonna be challenging. And for a lot of us, hey man, we're gonna take the rapids and we're gonna cruise as fast as we can. And we're gonna do, Eric, all the things we have to do to not be the broke agent, but to be the wildly successful agent. So, so this is really what I wanna talk about. And it's funny, like Byron and I are you know, playing golf yesterday and in Dallas, by the way, in case you were wondering, it was beautiful. The weather was great. It really was. It was like 95 degrees and breezy. Uh, after last year's summit, right here on this stage, I remember, because every year after the summit, all the questions change. The, the questions go, like, leading up to the summit, I get whatever's on the sort of zeitgeist of people's minds. And then after the summit, I get a whole new shift of conversations. The difference is now, and I, I'm sure you all do this after every appointment you go on, you stop and you write down the concerns and considerations of the customer you were just with, right? Nine of you out of 5,500, good. Um, <laughs> side note, might be a good idea to start capturing the notes of what happened with every appointment to understand how the consciousness of your customers is shifting because it's always moving and we all want to be on the zeitgeist. We all want to know before everybody else what is on the minds of the customers. So last year, I just opened up Evernote. And after every event, someone would come up and say, how do I do this? And what do you recommend here? And I just saw them speak. And oh my God, I can never do that. And what would it take to be on TV? And I started just capturing all the questions, all the questions, all the questions, all the questions, leading all the way up literally until like Saturday afternoon of this week. 
And what's different now is I can take the entire file and upload it into chat GPT and say, synthesize for me. And guess what? I'm really only being asked seven questions. I believe whether you're here to see your friends, to get recharged, to refocus your business, to modernize your marketing, to get your hands around this thing called AI, every one of us is looking for seven answers to seven questions. Now, I took the time, I might be too far away from the clicker, to start synthesizing all the answers and to taking my best step forward to be that guide for you, to be the person that can offer some insight. And many of you, you know, and you hear stories of how many people I talk to. And right now I've got about 1,076 text messages I have not responded to so far today. All that means is I am blessed to have more connections and more relationships and access to people that have insights on the market. One of my closest mentors is a guy named Joe Hanauer. Joe is 84 years old. I want you to picture if Yoda was a five foot four man, what he would look like. That's what my buddy looks like. Yes, thank you. And literally, oh, you guys are just getting here? I'll start over, okay. And literally, my friends, check this out. I am so blessed because see, Joe has retired seven or eight times. He owns a bunch of a little town called Laguna Beach. He used to own a company called Cole Banker. You know that brand. He had another real estate company. I'm forgetting the name. He started a little company called Realtor.com. Like, he's kind of been in our industry for a while. And I remember sitting with Joe and saying, Joe, here's the seven questions I get the most. And then just walking him through it. And then my buddy Steve Azonian, who's another mentor of mine, who's, you know, 70 and married to Lynn, who he met in the third grade and he's got two sons and he's just, he's in great shape. Like everything about him for me is the ideal mentor, right? He's got the whole package. And I said, here are the seven questions I keep getting. And then I walk them through the questions and say, am I missing something? Because even I need a guide at times. Even I need that, like, give me perspective. Tell me what's going on. And every single one of them said the same thing. You're on point. The challenge is we need about 10 million agents to hear it. So you're getting it first. Are you guys ready? Now, I answered each one of them. And by the way, that's the first. You're going to see that all seven are point number one. They're all point number one for a reason. Because your question may be different from her question, from his question, from the dude with the great hair's question. Bro, stand up. Just stand up, dude. Get, can we get a camera on this? You guys see that hair? Yeah. Don't, don't cut that. If anybody says cut that, don't cut that. And if you do cut it, my friend Kurt Kessel would like it. All right, so come back to me. Come back to me. Kill the music. So... So here's the deal. You got a sneak peek of number one. The number of times that I was told in the last 12 months, Tom, I'm tired. The pandemic was hard. And oh, by the way, we had this life experience. Someone got cancer. You know, someone passed away, right? The real stuff that we all deal with every day, right? With our customers, but we also deal with it in our own lives. And, and when you get a couple thousand people over 12 months that tell you they're tired, they feel beat up, they've, they've lost some of that fire, the question always was, how do I get the fire back? You can't relate to this, right? Right, a little battle with breast cancer, kind of toughens you up. But Karen, it also sometimes takes a little of our mojo away. We start to doubt ourselves, we start to question ourselves. And I don't know if any of you in the room experienced that in the last 12 months, but I know many of you text me with something similar to that. Like, am I really want to do this forever? Is this what it's going to look like? I'm not sure if I like this anymore. And it really got me thinking, this question, you ever felt like quitting? Okay, let me, let me try that again. Who besides myself has ever felt like quitting? Ready? Now, I didn't say like quit on everything, but who's ever used some nasty words and said, is this, you guys ever been there? Say I, if you've been there before. So I shared something with a very intimate group of people, many team leaders inside this room, trying to help them understand that we all have those thoughts, right? We all have these thoughts where like, oh, is this it? And it was great for me because this year I'm celebrating two decades of doing this, but 34 years of my life, this is what I've been involved in. 
And when I started reflecting back, now don't clap, it makes me feel old. When I started reflecting back and thinking about the first year that we started this company, the first year, startup mode. How many of you, I'm just for fun, you're one year less in real estate, raise your hands really high. Have you had any thoughts of quitting yet? Or just drinking? You're drinking to suppress the thoughts of quitting, in case you're wondering. But in year one, I come out all fired up, and many of you know who my dad is, and, and Eric, he wasn't saying supportive things, right? He was saying to all of his friends, don't worry, he'll be back, which is all I needed to hear to continue to persevere. But there was no doubt, Jay, that multiple times throughout that year, looking at my four-year-old and two-year-old, knowing that I was going to be on the road basically every day for the next three to five years, telling my wife, I love you, I'm going to miss you, because the only way I can make this work is I've got to go all in 1,000%. And the next year, it actually started to pay off, and I still hated it. Hi, my name is Tom Ferry, and I still hated it. I hated the fact that I went from running this wildly successful company to going right down to the bottom and starting the whole thing over again. And I got to like $6 million in revenue in my second year in business. I didn't make any money. I think I took a salary, kind of. Didn't cover any ounce of my lifestyle. Instead, I was watching my savings account go from here to here. Has anybody ever had that before? Raise your hands really high in your business. Okay, so I wasn't alone in my thoughts, yes? But then in year three, it felt like this massive breakthrough. We, we know in business, if you can get to $10 million, like that's the unicorn, like you're on your way. And I got to like nine, six. And I thought to myself, it's 2006, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could go wrong. That's revenue in case you're wondering. But what was funny is, I was out telling people at the end of 2006, hey man, sell that third house that you bought for no money down, get rid of the lease that you can't afford and maybe sell your Rolex, get yourself in a cash position. And oftentimes, we've been in this scenario before, myself included, where the advice I was giving, I wasn't taking. I was still hiring, I was still ramping up, I was still trying to grow the business, going right into an absolute tsunami. And the next couple of years, there's my first five years, all five years I wanted to stop. All five years, in 2008, I remember playing golf with my buddy Claude and literally saying to him, you know what, man? I could just go home, coach a few people, and I'd be just fine. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he says, partner, this is just temporary. You got more to give. Get that shit out of your head. That's a good friend, right or wrong, guys. And guess what? The next year, I didn't feel like quitting, but it was still hard. I was six years in. Six years of Lisa saying to myself, Am I good at being a CEO? Can I really do this? Like, I know I can go do a seminar. I know I can do coach. But like, can I really run a business? Can I really lead my own community? Even I was doubting it. Then I get to, what, is it, what year is that? 2010? And the only difference was I launched a book. And we did really well. And guess what? Most of that year, I felt like a failure. Most of that year, I walked around saying to myself, with you, Dave, let's go, man. Come on, you got this. And then I would go home at night sometimes and think to myself, what am I doing? Like, is this it? Is this my life? Am I going to live on the road for the rest of my life? Am I going to miss my kids and miss my family? I know none of you have ever had these thoughts. I know I'm alone in this, right? And then I started looking and saying, wow, the next year we did better and I still felt like quitting. And then what year is that? 2012? 2012 was the first year I actually made any money in my first nine years of running a business. All the owners of companies in the room, all the team leaders in the room, raise your hands really high. Do you hear me? I was nine years in. Nine years of watching my savings account go to this and my wife saying to me, like, I love you, but I'm gonna miss you. I'm not sure how much longer this is gonna work for me. That's keeping it real, right or wrong, guys. This is the entrepreneurial story that nobody wants to talk about. The next year, all of a sudden we start doing okay. And then the next year, I get cancer. That kind of sucks. This is how it happened. I go into the doctor's office, Dr. Kathleen Hutton in Newport Beach, and she says, hey, let's do your annual. You're a little too lily white. You probably got something. And she's like, oh, this thing on your back. She's like, lay down. And just, what the? 
I was like, could you put a needle in me first and numb this thing? She's like, oh, I just got something. We're going to put it in this bag. And like, by this point, she's wearing a hazmat suit. And she's like, we're going to send that thing off. And I was like, cool. I'm like, when are you going to let me know? She's like, I'll let you know in a little bit. Great. I'm going to New York. Karen Peters, you were there. Jill Biggs, you were there. Jeff Johnson, where are you? You were there. And I'm doing a three-day conference in, what's that horrible place that we call the New York area? Somebody help me out. The Meadowlands. And the conference ends, and I get on the plane, and it's Friday before I got on the plane. Phone rings. It's Kathleen Hutton. I'm walking with Mark Johnson through JFK. I answer my phone. I go, hey, Kathleen. She goes, you have cancer. I was like, how about warming me up first? How about a little rapport? She's like, no, you got cancer. You need surgery right away. And yet, that year was the same year that my wife and I took our kids And we went to a little place called Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I can tell you as clear as day, I was in this mindset of like, cancer's real. And I'm lily white. And I can call my mom and say, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been sitting on the beach all those years with my coloration. Or I could take responsibility for the fact that I had to do what I had to do. And then it got me into this mindset, Jay, where literally you start to look at your life and you see things differently, right? Like the birth of a child makes you very quickly realize, wow, like this is very real. My life is different now. And in that experience, I wrote for the first time a combined my wife and I 20-year vision. And David, that was the only thing that got me through that year. That 20-year vision where I said, okay, it's 20 years from now. Michael's 34, Stephen's 36. Kath and I are living this way. We're spending a lot of time at Jackson Hole with our friends and family. We're playing pickleball. We didn't say that because it wasn't there, but I can edit it. And I'm putting all this stuff in, and it's this realization now that I have more to live for than just the work. The identity of being this guy who gets on stage with his friends go, people listen to you, right? Like, it was real for me. But for the first time in a long time, it wasn't just about another session, another call, another this, another airplane, another trip, another event. And then look what happened. The second I got clear, the second I was like, that's where I'm going. This is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is what I'm not going to stand for. All of a sudden, the business takes off. All of a sudden, everything starts working. And then what happened that next year. Does anybody else remember March 15th-ish of 2020? And I remember being not in a panic. I was actually very certain. I'm like, okay, I got early access from a friend who's probably watching now, Janelle Garrison, who said, hey, Orange County's gonna shut down, but just for like two weeks. Remember that two-week conversation? I was like, awesome, two weeks, we'll sit by the pool. My team was like, I'm like, no, 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 go buy 155 laptops. We're going totally remote. We're doing it tomorrow. And I'm going to create a new program called Pivot because I have a feeling a lot of people are going to have a lot of uncertainty for those two weeks. So let's deliver something of value for two weeks to move people through this. And two and a half years later, it ended. We all went through it, right, guys? And we all survived. And then guess what? We got back to growing again. And the next year, we got back to growing again. And then the market shifted again. And now here we are in 2023. And around, I don't know, January of this year, I turned to my wife and said, I'm not sure if I want to work anymore. We bought enough real estate. I don't know, simplify our lifestyle. Let's get a puppy. You know what I mean? Who's ever been there before? Be honest. I'm not in a place where I can retire in style. But, you know, I could lower my ambitions and I could lower my goals, and I can lower my expectations, and I could probably do okay. And I thought to myself, what the blank is the matter with you? How dare you be such a bitch? A candy ass. All my friends, you've heard what I've said to you before, stop being a candy ass. And I'm looking in the mirror at myself saying, you need to stop being a candy ass. And then you know what, Dan? I open up my laptop, and I look at my 2015 vision, And my wife and I had achieved everything on the list except the boys weren't old enough. Everything that we decided I had achieved. And I thought, no wonder. What's my purpose right now? Why am I doing this? What am I fighting for? What is it all about? At a certain point, my friends, without this, it's just work, yes or no. Steve Cohen, how many times have we had this conversation, right? 
So some of you were with us a couple of years ago when we asked Seth Godin to come to the stage and he ultimately ended up coming in virtually. And if you remember, there was an extraordinary moment that I'm not sure how many of you caught, but he said there was a wonderful research piece and it's now done multiple universities around the world. And the research piece was simply this. We're gonna take individuals, we're gonna drop them, Brian, someplace in the middle of a forest. And we will observe to make sure they don't die but Chris, we want to study what does one do when they are clearly in a potential life or death situation where they don't know where they're going. And you know what happened? 90% of the people walked in circles. 90% of the people did basically this. And it made me think to myself when he was saying it, I've had a few years in my business I've had a few months in my business where I was just walking in circles. I was repeating the same thing over and over and over and over. And it looked like a lot of activity and it looked like I was moving, but I wasn't going anywhere. Will you do me a favor, turn to your buddy and say, have you ever been there before? Could you please give them an honest answer? How many of you can think of a time where you repeated the same year over and over again and you wake up and you're like, wait a minute, I've been here before. It's January 1st, I'm hungover again. I have no listings, no escrows, no pendings. What the hell's going on here? Who has been there before, say I? I'm keeping it very real with you. I found myself in that same spot. And then... He said the best thing. He said, but Tom, the difference was the 10% of the people had a point of reference. They looked up and they're like, that's the tallest peak. That's the sunset. That's the sunrise. I can follow that. There's a crevasse between the mountains. There's a pretty good chance there's a river there. If I follow the river, I'm going to find my way to safety. I'm going to find my way to the promised land. And Randy, when he said it, I was like, it's so clear to me. Most of the world is walking in circles. And a very, very, very small percentage of us or have a clear reference point of where we're going, a clear path. And you know what? I mean, if you've ever read the Bible or you've studied any, anything, anything religious, what do they all say? Those without a vision, what? I'm sorry? Forget your religion. We all know this to be true. So the question then becomes, for all of us, all of us, maybe, 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 for a lot of my longtime friends, Jeff, it's time to re-examine what my mentor, Mike Vance, said to me that caused me to go start this business. He said to me, Brandy, when I said, God, you've worked with Steve Jobs and Mother Teresa and Jack Welch and you invented the salad bar and you've done all these extraordinary things in your life, what is it that makes all these people so, so extraordinary? Like, there must be, like, clues of success. And he said, Tom, it's actually very challenging. But each and every single one of them answered five questions. And the first question is, what is their purpose? Why are you on this planet? Why are you really here? And I remember him, you know, over a glass of wine and a double espresso, Sheila, at 9.30 in the morning, because that's how he rolled. Eric, we were just having this just sort of cathartic discussion around, like, where, where do I want to go? What is this really all about? Like, is this it? Now, I know all of you are going to die, yes or no? Yes? And when you die and you're on your deathbed, are you going to be like, let me tell you about this transaction I did? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So we know in 1955, there was a flip in human psychology. And prior to 1955, if you had multiple identities, not personalities, but multiple identities, you were insane. And they were going to lock you up because you, you know, you were one way with this group and another way with this group and different with your family. And something around 1955, the consensus was actually the person that's always the same, exactly the same all the time, they're batshit crazy. The rest of you, we should be a little different from your spouse than with a for sale by owner. Does that make sense? And that's when it started to shift. And he said, Tom, you can have multiple identities, but at your core, why are you on this planet? And then he said to me, what are your values? And I'm like, why does that matter? And he said, if you don't know what you value, Scotty, think about the influence you have on so many. And think about how many people are coming at you every day saying, Scott, we want you to do this. Scott, we want you to do that. Scott, try this. If you're not clear on what you value, you will say yes or no to the right and wrong things. And Christoph, you've heard me say this so many times. I challenge you. 
I found myself in January going back to this. And it's completely relit the fire because now I know what's going to happen the next 10 years and I know what's going to happen for the next 20 years. And this team, I didn't think like a candy ass. I thought really big. You with me on this? Number three, he said, what are your God-given talents? What do you do, Byron, that is effortless but also provides value? You with me? Because my son could say, playing video games is effortless. Does it provide any value? You with me? Some of you are like, I smoke weed and I'm good at it. Does it provide any value? Maybe to your dealer. Question number four, though, was the big one. It's 10 to 20 years from today. What's the impact that you made? It's 10 to 20 years from now, Amy. What is the impact that you made? You have the blessing of saying you can drive through a community and say, I built these houses and I named those streets. That's an impact. You with me on this? But that question, so here's what's interesting. Uh, Alex, and I'm going to space on his last name, a very famous now YouTuber, made an interesting comment. He recently said, you're all going to die. And when you do, all of your friends and family are going to show up. And they're going to mourn you. And then they're going to eat some food. And then they're going to get in their car and they're going to leave and go live their life. And most of us will be forgotten within about 10 years. It just is what it is. Doesn't mean your friends and family don't love you. It just happens every day because the world is busy. And he said, since that's the case, you might as well go for something really crazy because no one gives a shit. Kind of a sad but true statement, isn't it, Eddie? That we all have a tendency to suppress our ambitions for fear of what others might think, for fear of what others might say, instead of just saying, I'm going to go for crazy. I'm going to go for crazy. What does crazy look like for you? What does crazy look like for you? And then he said, who do you have to be at that level? Now, we're going to spend some time on this, maybe this afternoon, maybe tomorrow, maybe the last day. But this question is the question. Take a photo of it. Because this is the one I want you to think about tonight. If you were to go for crazy in the next 10 years, what would crazy look like? What would like mind-boggling insane look like? What would ultimate success look like? Health in family, in relationships, in finance, in impact, in contribution. Now, you've all heard this before. And remember, I'm only on point number one. And point number one is, I've lost the fire. How do I get it back? And Deb, this is temporary. But if we don't relight the fire, what happens? We become complacent. We lose sight of the purpose. We lose sight of, like, Eric, why we're really doing this. So, you know this but I'm gonna jam because I'm way late. By the way, you want a little pro tip? You guys want a pro tip? Okay. Do that prompt in chat GPT. Do it tonight. Because you know what I did? Nick, I took, I started to write all of my vision that I'm like, wait a minute, I have this superpower tool. I'm just gonna ask it to ask me a bunch of questions. I'll answer the questions and then I'll have it synthesize my entire 20 year vision. And it did it in seconds. That's a pro tip, my friends. So what if just for the next couple of days, your entire concentration was either to find the purpose or if you already know what it is, to listen through the filter of the purpose so everything is about does this align with what I'm trying to achieve on a bigger level? The market's going to be the market for the next three to five years. Those of us with clarity, Those of us that know who we are, what we stand for, and what we're going after, we're going to cremate the market and serve so many people, and others will perish, and you have to decide. So here's question number, or the the second thing. Number number one, aka number two, I got this 10,000 times. What should I do? Tell me what to do, coach. What do I need to do? And I remind everybody of the same thing. When you have too many things you're concentrating on, you don't do any of them well. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Say I. And when you are like, well, I'm trying to do this and I'm doing a little of this and I'm doing a little of this and I'm doing a little of this, what happens is you give a little bit of effort here and a little bit of effort here and a little bit of effort here. And then in an environment like this where the transaction count is down, what do you end up with, Jenny? A little bit and a little bit and a little bit that don't add up to enough. And therein lies the struggle. So I always go back to this. So if you've never seen this before, Just think about it like this. Where am I today on the life cycle of my business? 
Am I five years or less in real estate? Raise your hands if you're five years or less. Raise your hands really high. You're in startup mode. You're a startup. Startups have to be scrappy. Startups have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or you die. It's that simple. Some of you, though, you're in growth mode. You're adding, you're adding, you're adding people and new lead sources and new opportunities. Some of you are a cash cow right now. I'm talking to some friends right now that because of either their ancillary businesses or their primary team, they're making a fortune right now because they're gobbling up market share and they're adding more people to their team and they're able to really expand. But there's a lot of fading winners right now in this business. So let's play a game. Grab your phone really fast and on the home screen, just show it to your neighbor. Like the home screen where all your apps are, just show your buddy what's on there. And I want you to very quickly, even if you're watching with me online, just identify where ChatGPT, the app is on their homepage. Where is ChatGPT on their homepage? Where is ChatGPT on the homepage of your phone, ideally within thumb's reach? So heads up, Shh. if it's not there, you're a fading winner. Your best days are behind you. Gary Keller said something that I thought was fascinating. You're losing so slowly you think you're winning. That's a fading winner. Shout out to Gary Keller. That was a killer line. And some of you, it's time to blow the whole thing up again. And that means you're in restructure. But all of it, my friends, look at the slide. Everything points back to Teresa, what we know. Pedal to the metal on growth. Pedal to the metal on growth. You might want to take a photo of this. You know what I wish for all of you? Joy, grace, peace, happiness, health. And you know what I see as I talk to people? I see no growth, no joy, no love, and there's only three systemic reasons why. They're in complaint, they're criticizing everything, and they're constantly comparing this year versus 2021, this year versus the past. Show me a loving, healthy relationship that's riddled with complaint. Show me a lovely business that is nothing but criticizing the people around you. Show me something that is prosperous where all you're doing is comparing it to everything else versus having the grace to honor who you are and what you do. To accept you're happy with where you're at and we want more, not I hate this stupid business and such and such is doing more than me and two years ago I was. Do me a favor, poke your neighbor and say, he's talking to you right now. That was good. I think he's, he's just, he's talking to me. You just blew off your neighbor entirely. I appreciate that. So it begs the question, it begs the question, Eric, what do we need to shift our focus towards? So let's do a homework assignment together. Ready? Let's do something together. In your notes, I want you to write this down. What are three things or two things? Do it very quickly. You know that you do in this business that you love. Like just two or three things really fast. I do this, Jenny. I love it. It's easy. It's effortless. It makes my heart sing. I have so much fun when I'm doing it. What are those two or three things for you in your business that you love doing? That you love doing. Okay, you got it. Let's go to the next one. Write down two or three things you hate doing. What are two to three things in this business that every time you do it, you just, ah, paperwork. What do you hate doing? The scary part is I think someone just said follow up and I want to punch you. What are the two to three things you hate doing? What sucks your energy? What has you saying, why am I doing this? And then what are two or three things you do that make you money? What actually makes the cash register go ching? What do you do that makes you money? What do you do that makes, well, just two or three things. What makes you money? Like, hey, making phone calls, going on appointments, helping clients, negotiating deals, right? What makes you money? But then here's the big one. What doesn't make me money? What actually maybe costs me money? Think about it. There's so many smart people inside this room. You know the answers. You know. And yet, and yet, what do we know? Highly focused people, they prioritize. 
highly focused people don't have many things going on. Lisa, you and I in our conversations, what are you doing right now? Recruiting. Anything else? Nope, recruiting. Because once I get north of 100 agents, man, this thing really takes off, and it did. And I'm like, okay, but we got some other things. And I love her. She's like, nope, recruiting. And all of a sudden, the business starts to grow like crazy because one of the most dynamic people inside the room stops Lisa doing 50 things and says, I'm going to do this exceptionally well. And all of a sudden, the business starts to blossom. And yet many of you have your hands in 50 things and you wonder why. Choose your heart. There's $97 billion out there. Go get the money. Do you guys get that? Go get the money. So the question is, what are the adjustments? Will you just write in your notes, what's one adjustment you know you need to make? Just one. What's one adjustment you know you need to make to go get the money? Just one. Just one. Just one. What's one adjustment? Do me a favor, look and see what your neighbor wrote, and if it's good, steal it. Because it's probably applicable. All right, kill the music. I got a jam. I'm so late already. All right, so raise your hands if your neighbor had ChatGPT's app on the home screen of their phone. Raise your hands really high. Oh, man. Okay, so that's about... 10 or 15 percent? All right, you guys ready? Shh. You want to talk about the future of real estate? Do you want to talk about where things are going? How many of you know the name Astro Teller? Write it down. Uh, His dad helped Oppenheimer build a bomb. His dad is a very smart guy. Who else names their child Astro? Astro Teller predicted about 15 years ago that we would hit a moment in time with machine learning and AI where the AI essentially would be smarter than us and be able to take over. He refers to it as the singularity. He says it's going to happen in 2035. Elon Musk has already come out and said, I can see mathematically why he would say that. Between now and then, before we become, I don't know, fat and lazy and doing nothing, who's going to make all the money between now and that moment, this is not rhetorical, I'm referring to the person sitting in your chair. Who's going to use some of this, the just extraordinary technology that's now available at our fingertips to go further, farther, faster, be more efficient, serve more clients? So in 2035, I guess when the robots take over and the rest of us just go to the beach and hang out, that it's okay because you got all the money you don't want to be in the position where you're not in that sector. So here's what I'm telling people. We're exiting the age of asking how. We're exiting the age of asking how. And we are entering the era of asking, what do I want and who do I need to ask? What do I want and who's the expert that I need to ask? All of my coaching clients in the room, raise your hands really high. What if I told you I took a small amount of everything I know and the coaches know and put it into an app plus all of our content, all of our materials, and we're adding all of your country or your state's legal regarding real estate. And then all of my mentors and all of my heroes from a negotiation standpoint, a sales and marketing standpoint, and we put it into a little app called Tom AI. And you're going to be able to talk to me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we will have real-time conversations. And as you're sitting there saying, how do I do this? You don't have to wait for another 72 hours before you have a conversation with your coach. You can actually type in, how would Jason Pantana do this? How would Coach Carey handle this? What's the answer? And in real time, you're going to get the answers and say, unpack that for me. Can you convert that to a script? Can you make that an SOP? Can you convert that into a schedule? And in real time, you will have all the answers you need so you and your coach can just talk about what's getting in the way of your execution and get after it. Does that make sense? Anybody interested in that? Yes? Okay, you say yes now, but you don't even have ChatGPT on your phone. But it is coming for you. We've been working on this little baby for about seven weeks, but it's been my dream since we launched Loom in like 2017. So we're entering this era where now 
everything you want. And here's the point. It's not all of it. It's like 80 to 85% of everything you need in real time, instantaneously. How many of you saw the movie, The Matrix? Okay, so for the rest of you, you might not understand this. But in the movie, The Matrix, they're living in a simulation where they have access to AI. Make sure the volume's up loud for this. This is our future. Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. That, my friends, is our future. Now, that either scares the shit out of you, or you now realize who has kids that are in high school or elementary? So uh, at that AI4 conference, I spent some time with a guy named Sam Khan. He started the Khan Academy. Anybody familiar with the Khan Academy? He is now connected to OpenAI with the Khan Academy, and that is the future of education. Every one of our children will have an AI for themselves personally. And in the next 18 to 24 months, every single one of you will have your own AI, your own personal AI that knows everything about you and all of your confirmation biases. And when you turn on your favorite news show, if you tell the AI, please remind me of my confirmation biases, it will tell you the alternative to what that no show is saying. So at least you have some perspective versus most assholes in this country that only have one point of view. Did I say that out loud? You with me on this? But here's the thing, you ready? You just gotta master all those. So could you take a photo of that? Cause that's your homework tonight. I want you to download every single one of them. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Instead, I want you to acknowledge that you've been here before. Who remembers when there was a whole bunch of search sites to go to? Who was on Ask Jeeves? Come on, people. You're like, this is awesome. And then they dropped the Ask and it was just Jeeves. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe I'll go back to AOL. What is the only search site you go to now? Tell me. Oh, so there was a whole bunch and then there was one that you got really good at. And then remember when all the websites started popping up at like 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and suddenly there was millions of websites. And how many do you go to? 11, Amazon, maybe just one, Amazon, <laughs> Prime. So we've been here before when there was an overwhelming amount and then it got simplified to one. And then you can remember, remember apps? Remember the app store? Oh my goodness. 48 different things I could download to help me track stuff that I don't do. Remember all those apps? Let me give you a little heads up. If you have an iPhone, once you get beyond the first screen, you should just delete all of that stuff because you never look at it. And the real deal is all the action is within thumb's reach. So how many apps do you actually use today? Lang Glide, Palm Agent, maybe your MLS. So guess what? AI is going to be the same exact thing. There's going to be thousands of things coming at you, but right now for us, there's only 10 things that AI actually does. And the good news is, I'm going to give you my prediction, and then Jason Pantana over the next few days, starting with today, is going to walk you through, here are the 10 most applicable ways for you to create more efficiency, better client experience, attract more customers, have a better brand, do more marketing, so we can get all the confusion out of the way and narrow it down to four or five for you guys. Does that sound good? Would that be valuable, yes or no? And here's why. Here's my prediction. Who lives in the U.S.? Raise your hands really high. Let me tell you what's going to happen in about, oh, I'd say 12 months. You're going to get a phone call and you're going to look down at your phone and it's going to say, Joe Biden. And you're going to go, no way. Hey, and he's going, hey, 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 man, I'm, I'm calling because I need your vote. I need you to show up this year. And you're like, dude, I got to be honest. I'm not feeling it this year. I, I don't know. And he's like, come on, come on, man, come on. And you're going to have a full-blown conversation with his AI who handles all of your objections and does everything in their power to get you to go vote. And then you're going to look down and it's the other guy. I did not and hopefully, have thank you. sexual relations with that woman. Okay. 
we knew he was lying, and most of us were like, we'll take four more years anyway. I don't, I don't give a shit. Like, just keep up the good work, man. But you're going to get a phone call. And by the way, if you live in the U.S., guess what? The do not call list doesn't exist for politicians. Every single one of you is going to get a phone call. And don't be shocked when, like, I don't know, Kanye calls you and says, I need your help. You got to vote. It's going to be weird the next 12 months, people. It's going to be really, really, really weird for those of us that aren't ready for it. But let me tell you what's going to happen in the next 18 months for all of us. After the U.S. election, and yes, it'll happen in Canada and every place else around the world, your personal AI will not only prospect for you and follow up, it's also going to schedule your appointments, it's going to draft your offers, it's going to assist you with negotiations, it's going to close your transactions, and it's going to send out your closing gifts. That's what your personal AI is going to do in the next 18 months. Are you ready for that? Yeah, I got one person clapping. This could be the most exciting time on the planet to be all of us inside this room and watching live. This is so exciting. But then it begs the question, what the heck am I going to do all day long? You know what you're going to do? The stuff that the AI can't replace. You're going to go on appointments. You're going to build relationships. You're going to go to dinner parties. You're going to do open houses. You're going to engage people. But the difference is when someone walks in with a question, you're going to go, Hey, I need to know how to fly a B-12 helicopter. (laughs) Okay, let me explain how. That's what's going on right now. Are you guys ready for that, yes or no? Okay, some of you are lying your butts off. So let me show you how I know it to be true. Turn the volume up really loud. As I said earlier, our vision for our system is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. How can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Now, in case you're wondering, that was filmed five years ago. That's five years old. Five years old. Let me repeat. Your AI is going to make phone calls for you. It's going to schedule meetings for you. It's going to close transactions for you. This either gets you really excited about the possibilities of maybe a three-person team doing a 1,000 transactions a year, or some of you that are like, I don't even know how to use my phone, or I'm afraid of this, and I'm going to say to you, no one cares. No one cares that you're afraid. No one cares because the truth is many will become less relevant. Many will become less relevant, possibly even a few people inside this room, which breaks my heart. Those of us that are unwilling to lean in and take this experience, just one part of it, Jeff, and have the first mover advantage. Have the first mover advantage to start saying, every contract I get an offer, I'm going to upload it into ChatGPT and say, what is fair? What do I need to adjust? How would you recommend I counter this? And see how fast you get some interesting insights. That's the world we're going into, my friends, taking all of your reviews 
every review you have and uploading it to ChatGPT and saying, what are all the similarities of what these people are saying? Synthesize it for me. Bam. Now, how do I take all of those similarities and these things that people say about me and convert it into a marketing message, write it into an email, turn it into my Facebook ads, all of the language that they use of why they choose me. And that is like one one millionth of what's possible. Are you ready for that? Okay, so you ready? Remember this company? There's a theme here. Who won? Do you remember this device? Who won? You got to ask yourself. First of all, if, you're, if you have a business that has BL in the very beginning, it's bad. Blockbuster, Blackberry. The reality is all business is innovation and marketing. Yes or no, my friends? And what is the first one with an I? What is that word again? I, I kind of cooked you up. If you said is, I meant innovation. It's all innovation and marketing. And my, my challenge for all of us inside this room is, are you willing to adjust? And I already know the answer with you. Are you willing to say, I'm going to try this. I'm going to lean in. I'm going to check it out. And if you're feeling slightly overwhelmed, it's okay. Because over today and tomorrow and the next day, Jason is going to walk you through every one of these and make simple recommendations on what advice, what application, what solution. So ideally, remember, 80 to 85% of the things you're doing get done in seconds. You guys down for that? Okay, let's be clear. Whoever moves fast and first, everyone else is now following. Does that make sense? How long was it? I don't know for me, I think it was around 2012 when people said to me, so you're saying I should start shooting videos. I started in 2007 telling people shoot videos. It was about 2012 that people were like, are you saying that I should shoot videos? Do <laughs> you remember when someone told you, why would I go on the Facebook? Do you guys remember that? You're sitting in a conference right now having a massive opportunity to be ahead of everyone. I'm asking you to dive in. Is this on your phone? And if it isn't, what's your first assignment sometime today? It should be pretty obvious. So the strategy around AI, it really is the question. My answer is AI everywhere in every aspect of my business. Everything that can be used by it will be used by it. And when I started sending in January of this year, my designers, my videographers, my staff writers who were like, wait a minute, wait a minute, if I use that, Am I going to have a job? Am I putting myself out of business? I'm like, no, thank you. No, you're going to do 10 times the work faster. Do you guys get that? Welcome to the age of efficiency. Do me a favor, tell your buddy what you're thinking real quick. Go. What are you thinking? Tell your buddy, what are you thinking about? Thank you. What are you thinking about? What are you thinking? Achilles and his gold, Achilles and his gifts, Spider Man's control. What's up, baby? Saturday. I have a lot cooking right now. Saturday, me and you. What are you thinking? Yes, 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 yes. You? What are you thinking? Superhero, some fairy tale bliss. Just something I can turn to somebody yes. I can kiss. Yes. I yes. 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 Okay, so come back to me. Shh. Now, in 12 minutes or less, clearly I overcommitted. Let's go to the next number one. I got this question nonstop. So people would literally call me and say, my past clients in Sphere aren't calling me enough. I'm not generating enough business. I'm losing on listing appointments to people I felt like I shouldn't lose to. My offers aren't getting accepted. And all that speaks to me is your brand in the marketplace isn't significant enough to say, when I get an offer from Dave, I'm going to prioritize that one because I know who Dave is. I know what he's about. It's going to be right. The deal's going to get done. And that's the game today, always and forever. So we started dissecting this and acknowledging that in every brand or every marketplace, 
the consumer has an option to pay less. And we started saying, and in the absence of becoming an expert, you're only competing on price. And then what happens if things go sideways in the U.S. with buyer agency? Then what happens? And there's always someone that's willing to do it for less, right or wrong, guys. Always and forever, we see it everywhere. So I got this new friend. His name is Chris Doe. Super bright, really interesting character, referred by one of my coaches, and now we're having all these interesting conversations. He's an artist. He sees the world differently. He helps a lot of artists. So I'm helping him. He's helping me. And it's just one of those wonderful kind of new relationships. We were talking about amateurs versus experts from the standpoint of brand and positioning. Now, Mark Davison is going to lay down some serious tracks with us tomorrow on this. But what I decided to do is just take some of the stuff that we were in dialogue around around the difference between an expert and amateur as it relates to your brand. Your brand is, look up here, your face, your story, what people say about you. Yes, it's also your website, it's your social. All of that makes up the story that people say about you. And here's the bummer, look up here. The vast majority of people have zero differentiation. So I can just go with the cheapest one since the market's hot or the market's not, someone will do it for less. You see it every, how many of you have lost a transaction to someone you thought you shouldn't? Raise your hands really high. Oh, all of you. And yet, we see how it plays out. Amateurs are undifferentiated. There is no clear difference between us versus them. I don't know what they stand for. I don't know what they're for. I don't know what they're against. I don't know what their specialty is. I don't know what their expertise is. So it usually is just enough noise that people get attracted to the noise, and then when the noise just becomes repeated by someone else's noise, we lose it all. So we're clearly migrating, and you see the MLS data, towards the expert, highly specialized. Yes, they have some competition, but the competition's small in their marketplace. There's three, four, five of them that are recognized, Doug, as the place to go for X versus just join anywhere and be one of many. The other thing we discussed, and I want you to think about this, that the client self-diagnoses and describes their own solution. Hi, I'm on this website, show me this house. That's amateur hour. If you don't then say, JD, before I do, are there any other properties you're looking for? And if I had two or three pocket listings that are not on the market, would you like to see those as well? You're now taking the position of the expert and the expert is going to diagnose and then prescribe the solution. And we know it because most of you, you figured out your intake process, your onboarding of a new client is special, right? That they know this is different from anybody else I met with. Everybody else just wanted to show me a house. And you wanted to sit down and explain the process and help me understand and find out what my, my goals and dreams are. But this could be the most startling example of the difference between an amateur and an expert. The amateur struggles to talk about fees. And the expert says, this is what I do and how I do it and how I get paid. Tomorrow morning at 8.15, when you watch Elisa Essig literally say to a buyer, and if the listing agent only offers this much commission when I charge this, you come up with a difference, here's why and how. And when you get that, my friends, you are more prepared for what is coming. And if you don't get that, it's gonna get uncomfortable. We know that amateurs, shallow knowledge, experts, deep knowledge, right? So the question is, what do I have to do to gain the insight on everything in the, in the marketplace? If these two apps are not on your phone, I'm questioning your sanity. The first one my buddy Ryan told me about, Ryan somewhere in the room, one of the best agents in Dallas, longtime pal. He and I started connecting. And he's like, do you have Landglide on your phone? And I'm like, Landglide, what's that? He's like, oh, it's every lot in America and the owner of the property. Oh, I'm like, oh, that would be slightly helpful for some of us. And then my buddy Jeremy, his dad, creates a thing called Palm Agent. Can anybody figure out the timing of when he invented Palm Agent? Okay, there was a thing called a Palm Pilot. You might have to tell him about it. <laughs> you, you can Google it. You could probably still buy one, like on Amazon or something. They're kind of collector's items now. But the expert agent can sit there and explain in real time with all these different calculations, this is what you have to do, and this is how you do it, and this is what, it, and they're, they're giving guidance based on data and facts, not, hey, I got to call my loan officer, let me find that out, right? So the question is, what's your next move on brand? 
And I just write down this question, you ready? What am I the expert of? 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 All right, I'm gonna lovingly punch a few people in the face. You guys ready for that? Notice I said lovingly. So I'm talking to some of my broker owners right now. I'm talking to David, some of my teams right now. And I'm talking to every one of you that has an ambition to build a team or a team or a brokerage in this environment. So I have a feeling that probably covers every person in the room and then some. Here's what I want you to get. This environment, it's about lean or large. If your business is in the middle, you're dead. If you spend your entire day with, got a minute, hey, I need some help. What do I do here? How do I do this? I already know what your profitability looks like. It stinks. If you have more leads and you have agents and your agents aren't doing some of the things that you want, you're in the middle and you're in trouble. So let's just be really clear. A lot of us got caught up in the undisciplined pursuit of more. More, more leads, every lead, more agents, every agent. And some, some got a little over their skis because now this market is kind of revealing their SOPs or their lack of SOPs. It's revealing who they were hiring and throwing leads to. Their P&L is revealing a ton right now. And I'm not making it right or wrong. I told you for nine years, I didn't make any money in my business. I can speak from experience what it's like to be the number three coach in the world three years in and laugh because I wasn't making a dime in the process. You with me? So let's talk about it. There's only four ways to create profits. Now, of course, Don, I'm referring to you before your ancillary services, if you have that. Number one thing is increase the per-person productivity. Everybody has to sell more. I'm not sure if that works for me because of my lifestyle. Go work somewhere else. Because everybody here has got to do more because the market is tighter and we have strength in numbers and we can win if everybody's doing more. But if a a bunch of you are lagging on us and uncommitted, it's time to go someplace else. Is everybody clear? Because the game is per person productivity. The next one is you've got to control your company dollar and your operating expenses. If you're not making 30 to 38%, what are you doing? If you're not making 30 to 38%, I'd make the argument if you were a golfer, you're playing from the wrong tees. You're trying to play from the pro tips when you probably should be playing from the whites or the blues or the yellows. You should be playing in an easier game, not something that is so constraining for you. The next one is you got to grow your sales team with people that want to sell a lot of houses. If one more person tells me, I hired this person, he's so influential, his family, they know everyone, and I just say to myself under my breath, shit, that person's never going to bring us a deal, and they're never going to sell a house. Because if they had all those relationships and they were that influential, they wouldn't be talking to you about joining the team. Some of you in the room are going, holy shit, he's talking about me. And the last one is if you can, raise your average sales price. That's it. That's how you make money in this business. Before your ancillaries, escrow, title, mortgage, and everything else. That's how you make money. And since the market's going to be like this for the next three to five years, it should be extremely clear to you the adjustment you need to make. You have 100 salespeople, you need 300. You have 35 or 40, you're in the danger zone. I'm literally talking to clients and saying, are you playing from the right tees? If you don't understand golf, this is where Tiger Woods plays from. This is where Tom Ferry plays from. Do you want to know why? Because I move up to make it easy and make profit. I move up to make it easier to play versus ego that says, I'm going all the way back here and having to hit driver, driver, driver. Some of you know that's impossible to get there. Does that make sense to you, yes or no? All my teams and all my owners, yes? So consider the lean team, take a photo because I'm running out of time. It looks like this. You're getting the slides eventually. A lean team looks like this, but I want you to focus on this middle one right here. It's the operational leader who's accountable for running the business because it isn't you. 
because you're not good at that for most of you. You're really good at going on listing appointments and helping people and maybe even recruiting. Or it's the large team, and it looks like this. And you might want to take a photo of it and do a little assessment tonight of where do you stand. And notice a large sales team of sales associates who list and sell and manage a book of business that they actually manage a book of business, that you're actually building them up versus just here's another, here's another, here's another, here's another, but they start to grow their career and their business with you. So this is the way. So the question is, what's the decision you've been resisting? Do me a favor. Just share with your buddy very quickly, what are you thinking about right now? What's the decision you've been resisting? Share with your buddy. Go. Go. 